and just like that I'm hooked. Here we are, Love is Blind, season six. I'm gonna go over episodes one through three. I thought I would never watch again, but here I am, roped in, ready to go. Cheers. Welcome to Reality TV Therapy with me, Dr. Diane. If you're new to my page, welcome. I'm Dr. Diane Strakowski, licensed psychologist. I analyze reality dating shows looking for the lessons that we can learn. There are a number of channels out there and I'm just so grateful that you are here. Thanks for coming today. But I'm not a regular, typical recapper. I want you to learn something from my videos because maybe you see yourself, maybe you're dating or even in a relationship and you can relate to Jessica or AD or Jimmy or Clay. But do you know what your attachment style is and why it's important? Now, a caveat to all my videos, I do not know any of these characters. I'm really just making gross generalizations based upon the hundreds and thousands of clients that I have seen in my last 30 years of clinical practice. So in this video, I want to give you my impressions of Charlotte in general, and then talk specifically about each person's attachment style and where I think the pairings are gonna be. Now, as somebody who watches the show, unfortunately, I do not get an early version of this as a lot of recappers do, so I'm behind. This one is for episodes one through three only, so please no spoilers. I have not watched beyond episode three. I'm just gonna be commenting about early on what we can see going on in the pot. Okay, let's talk about Charlotte in general because I think there's some things to keep in mind here. First off, Charlotte really is considered the South. We're gonna see a lot younger people. I like the 30 year olds or older. I think they have, they're more invested in being married. But having said that, you can find mature 20 year old people, more Christian people, and we're gonna see more conservative people. So you might be able to relate to them, might not be a fit for you, but understand that also Charlotte, because there's some people who live in these little rural towns, is really spread out. I have a sister who lives in Charlotte. I've been there many times. There's a small downtown, but everything else, you're in your car and things are far away. So this season reminds me a little bit more of the Georgia season, if you ever watch that one. Okay, let's get into each of the cast attachment style. But before I say that, if you're interested in this topic and you don't know anything what attachment styles are, I highly recommend you check out my latest video, which is really a primer. Check it out, it's in the pink uh, thumbnail. I'll link it here, but I go over in depth what each of the four types. To briefly categorize, there is one, the anxious type who I call nervous, the person who gets attached quickly. We see a lot of them on reality dating shows. Two, there's the avoidant slash independent person who struggles with opening up. Three, the fearful avoidant type who has experienced some abuse and might have difficulty trusting people. And four, there is the secure functioning person who's usually the optimal person who doesn't struggle as much because they had a really good early life. Okay, but for a couple to be successful, you gotta know yourself, you gotta know your partner, and then understand how these two people come together. That's what I love about therapy. That's what I love about psychology is it's so nuanced that two people who might be the same type, kind of like astrology, can represent themselves very differently. Let's get into it. And forgive me because I've got many pages of notes. I wanna make sure I don't miss anything. Let's start with Matthew. And you can see I've got a red flag here. Okay, um, let's talk about Matthew, perhaps the most controversial person we've seen. Not ever on the show, but man, as I said, Matthew comes from a very small Appalachian town. He reminds me a little bit of JP. Do you remember JP and Taylor? Like, I'm assuming that he is an avoidant type. What do I mean by this? If you're avoidant, you grew up with parents that were a little bit more shut down. The whole point is to do things on your own. 
and you avoid high conflict, you avoid emotional content, and there's a rigidness to Matthew, right? Like he's hiding. He's hiding behind these list of questions. He says that I came up with the questions, not thinking that I should answer them back. You're like, really, Matthew? But some people are calling him a little bit on the spectrum. I don't know, because remember, these shows are highly edited. But he does feel somewhat like robotic, like AI Matthew, because he even says himself, Superman had a cold personality at first. Um, but here's what's important about Matthew, and here's what's important about all attachment styles. It's only when the person is under stress, or what I call hot water, that we see their attachment style come out. And here, in episodes one through three, the stress is mounting for Matthew, right? At first, he is so avoidant, he can't even stay in the room with these women. He asks a question and then walks out. But then suddenly Matthew has got two women on the hook and he's telling them the same thing, like a pickup artist. I'm like, who is this person? So we see him warming up, but ultimately, Matthew can't handle conflict, and he just doesn't know, like, how to read the room. He's also not connecting with any of the other men, like, I'm here for this, and he's very compartmentalized. All right, Matthew even said that he, what, he started seeing a therapist, and he could only say a few words, and you should have seen her face. I'm like, yeah, that would have been my face, because... I would have said, Matthew, I don't think you're quite ready for it. I mean, he's thinking that America is on his side. And I'm thinking, oh, no, Matthew, the tapes are rolling. We can see all of this. All right, we're going to get more into Matthew. Um, let's go with Jimmy. What would be your guess about Jimmy's attachment style? Because I at first thought he was a little bit hard to read, but I'm watching and I'm listening for family content. Like, how did Jimmy become this way? I think Jimmy is also avoided, and I'll tell you why. If you want to know a clue about why and how someone is avoidant, you know what they tell you? They tell you their family life was idyllic, okay? And Jimmy does a little bit of that. If you go back and listen to him, he says um, his family, great people, nothing negative, but it's a little bit defensive, right? Here's the thing, when you ask the same person, give me an example of something idyllic, Jimmy. He may not have a story, because I didn't hear that. Now, again, could be edited out, but that's what an avoidant person does. They gloss it over, like, don't come looking for anything here. My childhood was great, my parents were great, I got nothing. It lacks the depth, it lacks the nuance so that to me was a clue. Now, the next clue is how he handles intimacy, how he handles vulnerability. Because if you really listen to his words, it's kind of like pseudo intimacy, like he's baiting people a little bit. You know, he talks about his greatest accomplishment is graduating from college. Okay, is that super vulnerable? Um, He's expressive, but again, not about his feelings, more in a provocative way. And he's probably gotten some good feedback. Maybe he's had some swag. He's not the most attractive guy in the world, right? But he's calling these women his wife, and he's got, you know, that southern drawl, and he's kind of like, oh, hey, you're my wife. It's all about him though, right? Him talking about his travel, him wanting to go to all the football stadiums. Is he asking anybody else what they want to do? So let's talk about how Jimmy handles stress because this is your key again, okay? Jessica comes in and hasn't told him, we're early, these are early days, hasn't told him that she has a daughter. We're gonna get into Jessica, but he, doesn't say like, oh, wow, tell me more. Did you hear it? There's like a flip of anger a little bit, like, why didn't you tell me sooner? That's his first response. Now, he softens, he's kind of freaking out, right? He softens and gets there and then like, you know, what's her name? But that's 
where I call this person again independent, like he wants to maintain his independence, and I'm just not so sure that that's a fit. But there's like empathy that's missing. And he did the exact same thing with Chelsea, right? So two women, this is why I'm seeing this pattern, right? That she comes in and says, you know, this might be a red flag. We're going to talk about Chelsea because I don't think she should have said that. But he then is like, oh, you were married before with like such judgment and disdain. Yeah, especially in the South, people get married early. So that was the part that for me, oftentimes avoidant people aren't really good at feeding back empathy. And I get the feeling, honestly, that Jimmy just doesn't know himself very well. He says, I'm simple to please, but is he? Because I don't think he is. Um, we're going to get to all of that. Okay. What about Jeremy? Jeremy with the weird spelling. I don't know. My spell check is like uh, uh, not quite getting that. What do I think of Jeremy? Jeremy, I think he's another avoidant type, hiding behind all of the OCD, a little bit neurotic, um, kind of dorky. But when he talked about like having a nice family at the beginning, but not having that now, it just felt more distant, a little bit cold. And um, we'll talk about how he handles the women. Okay, let's go over Clay. Well, Clay... I've had people write to me about Clay. Um, Clay is giving off player vibes, right? Um, while you might think he's also avoidant, I don't. I think he's anxious and or fearful avoidant. Now, I watched this tape closely. I watched it twice. There was something for me that was cut. I think he might have talked about a difficult childhood with AD and we don't see it. So he did talk about like wanting to emulate his dad and having a big ego, um, but there's cockiness for sure here and certainly there is insecurity. But if you really listen to what he's saying, he's doubting himself, would people really like his personality? An avoidant person wouldn't say that. It, they would be more like Jimmy, not like that. Um, then he said like he feels like he's never been chosen for the one that he wants. That's something that an emotional person would say. And he also said, I don't lead with emotional security. I think because when he's under stress, he kind of flips a little bit, right? That's the anxious, angry person. But he's very flirty, right? Very affirming, very, you know, verbal. Uh, we'll get to the AD part, you know. Um, AD all day, right? He's got a lot of swag and one can say that he's like overcompensating, but he gets triggered easily and that's what an anxious, angry person does. They get angry because their parents are inconsistent, so now they kind of act up a little bit. But it, he feels to me different than a Jimmy type, right? He's looking for more reassurance and he's quite verbal with all the women and then of course he's also quite physical but because he can't do that and now here's the thing clay is not making any friends because he reminds me of uh shake right he's talking about physicality the show is love is blind this is not too hot to handle clay so it's like a big no but he is not um, rubbing people the right way. All right, let's talk about Trevor. Sweet. He has a little bit of um, anxious energy too. I can't say that he's totally secure, but I like Trevor, right? He's sweet. He's like a big teddy bear. He even says, you know, like women think he's like a big meathead and he's got a right? A big body, but he's trying to be somebody else. And he's talking about butterflies and rainbows and the notebook. I'm like, okay, Trevor, please. Um, if you really want to look into the notebook, it's not what you think it is. I mean, it's about the guy is like love bombing her. I, I can't recommend the notebook, but he's trying so hard. And I think he really wants love and he wants kind of like the really pretty women, uh, you know, feel like people don't give him a chance. That's like Trevor. He's like a attractive big guy and he just wants people to see beyond this to kind of get to know the soft 
side. Um, and then Trevor, as a lot of anxious people do, they get connected to one person and that's kind of his strength and kind of his weakness too. Okay. What about Johnny? Johnny with the long hair. I did a prediction video because I looked really quickly at those three seconds and I said Johnny's going to get engaged and sure enough because he's got the longer hair we saw him in that clip but Johnny is possibly a secure type he talks very positive about his big family uh, maybe they were a little bit enmeshed they only had one bathroom but maybe that was like they didn't have a lot of means um, but he talks about them being close and he's so supportive of Amy we're going to get to that that I um, really think he's just like a, he's just a good guy on, on Instagram. He's really outdoorsy, um, looks like he loves to travel. I think what you see is what you get with Johnny. Kenneth, here's the person I said who's 25 years old but seems so much more mature. Like he's already a principal of a school? You go, Kenneth. Very Christian, um, you know, but sad life. Life grew me up quickly, he said. Uh, when he was 12, um, his mother passed. He had to make funeral arrangements. I'm like, where was your dad, honey? Oh, anyway, Kenneth is just another big teddy bear. Um, but he does say that he looks at his mom and dad for how they want to live. Um, I don't know. Is he secure? I just feel like I don't have enough information. I want to know more about Kenneth's family. Um, and we'll see. All right. What about the women? All right. I want to move through this a little bit quicker. So the women, what do we have? We have Chelsea. Who do you think Chelsea is? Take any guesses? She's anxious. And you see her being a bit of a chameleon because she's a little bit different with Trevor than she is with Jimmy. But unfortunately, Chelsea has just some things that are holding her back. All right, she didn't go to college. No big deal. Um, she's done a lot of different things, right? Like yoga instructor, flight attendant. Flight attendants are very attracted to the show. I heard because they have flexible schedules. But what's fascinating about the anxious person is I'm going to guess, and we're seeing this happening in real time, that she goes for the person who's the biggest challenge doesn't make sense, but why? Think about it. Usually, the anxious person has, again, inconsistency in their childhood. Parent that's there for them, sometimes not others. What you learn is that love is hard. I have to work to get your attention. I have to work to get on your radar screen. Say, my parent, my father maybe, is an alcoholic, not around a lot. When I find somebody who's readily available, like Trevor, it's not such a challenge. There's something about the challenge that makes me think this is love. Now I can backfire. We're going to find out lots about that. But I think that's why she's going to make the choices that she does because she learned this early on that that is what love is. One could say she's working too hard. I really want Chelsea to have more self-worth. And here's where I think she really, her anxiety gets the best of her. Now, we also know this is a competition. There's women in the lounge. We know that Jessica is also interested in Jimmy. I'm going to get to Jessica. And so then she says to Jimmy that she looks like Megan Fox. Okay, maybe some of her features are similar, but that was maybe Megan Fox 1.0, not the current version. And so it's really unfortunate. I would always tell people don't do this because you're actually just setting some kind of ridiculous expectations. Let's get to Jessica another anxiously attached person. But here's the thing. I think Jessica has done some work. What do you think? I think she's done a little bit of therapy. I mean, she's a survivor. My God. She, her dad, hold on. Her dad went to prison. Mom spiraled, went into foster care. Yep, yep, hold on. Went into foster care and then her dad ended up committing suicide. My God. Um, she was adopted and then she got pregnant with like her high school sweetheart and thankfully she was able to keep her child but but like wow this young woman probably missed out a lot on life and yes she probably puts a lot into her appearance but she sounds like she's a really good mom and after having all this 
early difficulty and maybe trauma herself, the fact that she's so connected with her daughter, I think is really tremendous. And she didn't get married and she wants to be married. And that's the anxious part, like she wants it so bad. Here's something else to consider. And I love this phrase, anxious people are often allergic to hope. What does that mean? Well, I want it so desperately, but sometimes I have blinders. I can't see the red flags. I've got rose-colored glasses because I don't want to be rejected or abandoned. So sometimes I don't call those things out and I get connected quickly. I go all in, just like Trevor is going all in on Chelsea and eliminating other options. Jessica is saying to Jimmy, you know, you are my first round draft pick and she's cutting herself off from other people and we kind of know how that ends. Okay, what about AD? AD all day. <laughs> what adorable person. I mean, honestly, I am rooting for this girl. Um, she reminds me of Nancy, uh, where you just couldn't help root for her with the whole Bartiz thing. But another anxious type, and she says, when I see the red flags, I just paint my nails red. I kind of liked that. I thought that was funny, but not. I mean, you just want the best for her. Why are there so many anxious women? Well, I've done a quiz. If you check out my other video, I give the statistics, but 46% of women, the most common type, fall into this, okay? What else do we know about AD? She's from Boston, um, but she's really, what I love about her, she's so reassuring. She's telling Matthew, who all the other women are like, ah, that he's a great person. And she really gives a lot of reassurance and she's really lovely. Uh, it sounds like she's trying, like you can hear her like working to set boundaries. I think she just needs to reinforce them a little bit more, but she somehow chooses, again, the guys who she can sort of like fix. Um, and I'm like, it's not fixer upper. It's love is blind. So I just want a little bit more for her. And then what's with the fear that birds are going to pick her brain? I, I've never heard that before. But I really am rooting for her. All right, let's talk about Lauren. We didn't see that much about Lauren. But when she says that I've never fit with anyone, I think this was she's in the lounge. I don't even remember if that's episode two or three that I've never fit with anyone. And she's super focused on like cleanliness. Um, and then even with Christmas, how she hates it. That to me felt more avoidant. And sometimes avoidant women are super picky. So I'm gonna go with that for right now. All right, Amy, precious Amy. I'm thinking she's secure. And the real problem for Amy is that she moved from Puerto Rico when she was five, okay? Five years old, think about that. She's in Charlotte, in the South. She probably just felt, again, that she didn't fit in. And so when she said that like her dad was begging people to come to her birthday party, I'm like, oh, Amy, honey. It was probably just because they were different culturally, not that there was anything wrong with, with Amy, but she has always, she said herself, she's just always felt love, but um, felt a little judged, like she was an outlier, but she really wants love and she wished for a brother and now she has a brother who has special needs and she wants to make sure that her partner um, he has autism and adhd she wants to make sure that her partner is going to help her take care of her brother and i just think amy is just lovely honestly and she's beautiful too all right what about Brittany? Brittany feels also like a woman beyond her years kind of like kenneth right it, that she is very religious though she wants to be led um, she can't, the best thing she can think of is when she turns to a man and um, says that, uh, you know, go ask your father. I think it was Brittany who was in the women's lounge and says, I want a man to be potentiated. <laughs> okay, there's so many words flying around. I'm like, uh, we need English, but potentiated, I just thought was funny. Like he's met his potential. I, I mean, the women are all frustrated with dating, right? Okay. All right, bear with me. I want to get through this quickly. So who are our main couples? We've got Matthew and AD, an avoidant and an anxious. More common than you think. This is where opposites attract. We were all hoping for like a Lauren and Cameron 2.0. This has become 
disappointing. All right. Matthew, again, can't handle it, but he's becoming like protective of her and like, I'm getting into it. And I'm thinking, maybe, maybe there's something there. And then you're like, whoa, okay, we're making progress. He says his biggest accomplishment is finding her. I mean, who wouldn't be flattered by that, right? You take this guy who seems like, you know, um, a robot, and he says these things, and you just can't help but be so disappointed. But talking about Matthew and AD, I have to be honest, that conversation they had about race was a little bit dismissive on Matthew's part. You know when somebody just is like, oh yeah, no problem, I'm cool. And didn't ask her, like, really how she felt about it. And it felt like there was a lot of nuance missing. And we're going to get to another couple that I think handled that so much better. But I really feel like Matthew just, how did they even get him on the show? I, I don't know. Um, he's so provocative, saying that he, um, you know, there's only two choices. You, you know, uh, you can leave with me. I'm going to take you away, whisk you away, like this big hero and then talking about you know i don't want to be some you know c-list person on tv and then but all of america is watching there were just so many things that were just odd odd and like we were rooting for you matthew um but he really messed it up okay let's talk about clay and um ad well here's two anxious people okay what do i think of that two anxious people can actually work but there's a lot of fire, a lot of friction, and there could be a lot of fighting. But when they meet two verbal people who have high energy, it's like, oh, my soulmate, you get me, finally. And when we need to look at what's so interesting about the show is that AD is going from Matthew, who says, I'm the quiet guy, I don't, I'm not that expressive, to Clay. There's just such a difference. And and now Matthew has hurt A.D. because he's doing this with Amber, too, that you can see that she he led her on, right, and really got under her skin. And so now she's got all this, like, rejection, and she's coming to Clay, and Clay is just, like, feeding into her. And we can hear, again, this energy between two people, lots of sexual tension, um, lots of... Um, banter, lots of flirtiness. Um, he, I mentioned the anxious, angry a little bit earlier. I just want to go over this because this is what happens. AD comes to Clay and says that they're in a love triangle, right? That she tells him that here's this other guy, Matthew. Well, not only is Clay incensed that he's in that position, like, why am I not enough? That's what an anxious person feels. But um, Matthew? Are you kidding me? This guy who, like, is rude to all of us in the men's lounge? Come on, girl. What are you thinking? So he doesn't handle his emotions well. He says, you know, I should be in therapy. I haven't been. We're like, get there quicker, Clay, because don't hurt our girl. Um, but he does try to say the right things, right? He apologizes, I'm sorry, I didn't use my words, I should have been better. And so AD kind of buys into this, right? That he's trying, okay? But I love that she called him out. Hey, listen, you were the one who said that you cared more about looks and that's not, that's not good. And then they still joke around that they're gonna look good together. I'm like, okay, let's move on. Jessica and Jimmy, a mix, another mix, most common, avoidant and anxious. Jimmy is in the catbird seat, right? He's feeling pumped because he's told two women, called two women his wife. Jessica is feeding right into this. You're my first round draft pick. Um, but he doesn't handle these things well. Again, the daughter, and then he says, it's not a deal breaker for me. Um, and I think Jimmy is just there kind of figuring out who's gonna work for him. And of course, Jessica's like, we're a whole package. She does obviously tell him and her situation. And you can just see, you know, he's working through his head that like, this doesn't jive for me and my whole perfect day of, you know, getting beers and having sex. And what do you mean your average day is you have to manage your daughter? So 
I don't know. I just didn't care for it. I don't, I don't care for him cracking his knuckles to test her. What is this? I just, I feel like not great. And um, I really end up like wanting more for Jessica, right? A, a guy who really will say those things, but like follow up big time. Okay. What about Jimmy and Chelsea? Another avoidant and anxious type, right? Um, here's my advice to Chelsea. Chelsea girl, if you're watching this video, do not lead with priming. Okay, what does priming mean? In relationships, you know when your mother says to you, we have to talk. With your mother or your boyfriend or your husband or anyone, we have to talk. That's called priming. You prime the person to be anxious by informing them of something big that's coming and then they get anxious to start with versus just like leading into it. When Chelsea says this could be a red flag, she actually primes Jimmy to have a bigger reaction to that than he might have if she'd just been like, oh yeah, didn't I? And she handled it perfectly with Trevor, didn't I tell you? I told you, I was married when I was young, no big deal. He was my high school sweetheart, um, not my person. But now Jimmy is, again, what, sitting in judgment? My gosh, it's like, okay, Jimmy, everyone has different if issues. So I feel like Jimmy is, again, provocative, using this against the women, but the lack of empathy for me is, um, is a big deal. And I think we're gonna see how that ends up playing out. Back to Chelsea and Trevor another anxious and anxious, right? He's not the same challenge for her. They both have dogs with the same names. But notice how Chelsea, because he brings out something different in her that she just so casually, yeah, of course I was married. What's the big deal? And Trevor says, well, everybody has a history. No big deal. It doesn't matter. And so Trevor would have been the better choice, but back to because it's her style to work harder and that equals love, she's going to choose. She's going to choose Jimmy. That's what's happening. Okay. What about Jeremy and Lauren? I don't know. Two avoidant people. Sometimes two avoidant people, um, they like it because it's like nobody's crowding them or bugging them. But here's what also felt provocative to me in a slightly different way. That when Jeremy is saying like, yeah, I wear Henleys because I don't like them touching my thick neck. That, that feels a little bit like, again, saying you look like Megan Fox. Like, what? You want to lead with, like, something else that you're insecure about. And I just thought, okay, we got two people talking about their Roombas and um, also provocative with the whole story about Christmas because, and, and he was provocative with Sarah Ann, too, about this house. And, and it, it feels... Um, like I'm not really learning much about him, just kind of like what he wants, right? Okay, let's talk about Kenneth and Brittany. I love them. I love these two. Um, they, they look like a great pair. Honestly, they got really lucky. He's so sweet. He's got the Christmas lights and the salad ready for her and they're painting together and they can talk about waiting to have sex um, after marriage. And I, I just think you know, so sweet how many babies. There's so many, like, overlap. They both lost their parents. They both um, have twins in their families. I just think this is really lovely. But here's the conversation that goes better about race, right? There's so much more nuance to this conversation. Like, how do you feel? I had a feeling, but I didn't know. And um, I, I think this is how the conversation should look. Now, Maybe he's, you know, fantasizing about her. I don't know if you want to call that fetish, fetishizing. He's having a fetish about her, that she's blonde. Um, and we'll see what happens uh, because I still don't know how these families are going to get together. Johnny and Amy, my favorite couple. Amy and Johnny both. Um, if I had to bet, I'd bet on this couple. They had the best reveal I've ever seen and the only reveal we see at this point. But the body language when they when they lit up you know so excited to meet not caring what each other looks like but yeah some people said that they thought amy wasn't attracted to johnny and i think in all fairness again give her a little time she's saying he's not my typical ethnic guy but you know she immediately said you have beautiful eyes and i i saw us i saw me with 
children that had lighter hair and lighter eyes. And so I think um, she'll get there. And they had such a deep connection in the pod. And, and even after, more importantly, that they're saying, you know, let's grow old together. Don't change anything. I, I mean, probably just one of the best reveals we've seen. I, I just thought that these two are really special. And um, it, you know, it doesn't get much better than that. Like, what more can you hope for? I really hope that there's not going to be any temptation with other people. At this point, we don't see them uh, interacting with other people. So I thought that was really kind of pure, like, like Brett and Tiffany, all good. So that's it. At this point, as I said, we have only one reveal. We had um, Kenneth proposing to um, Brittany. Can't wait to see that reveal. And it looks like with the previews, there's certainly more to come. But at this point, what I want to say is if you don't know your attachment style, make sure to take my love style quiz. It's super quick and fast, but you will know what your love style is. If you are partnered, you have a boyfriend or a husband or a partner um, or a wife, uh, please feel free to take my partner quiz too. It tells you so much about what to look for. But look a little bit deeper because sometimes people think one thing, but really listen to what they say and notice how they handle stress more than anything. And that's going to be a clue for you about your attachment style and your partner's. And that is a wrap. See you soon.